Peter Lever has worked across a multitude of industries and founded Therefore Strategic Technology Services in 2006, which focuses on assisting its clients to implement business process management oriented solutions that focus on enhancing quality and improving the customer experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Peter Lever. Hi folks, um, I'm glad they took that picture of me away because there was still hair on there. I thought you guys were going to be confused. That's been taken some time ago, I'm afraid. What we're going to be discussing today is moments of reality. It's a fairly simple little concept, but it's quite a powerful concept and it's also something we don't typically think about. So the reality is every time a customer interacts with you, that customer is given the opportunity to form an opinion of your organization. And that, op that opinion would obviously either be positive or negative. And over repeated interactions, what happens, the, those customer opinions tend to start becoming kind of entrenched. So all those positive and negative opinions start becoming entrenched and people start either liking your organization or not. The longer the time frame, the more the interactions and the more entrenched those opinions would be. Okay, so what happens is, those opinions start driving word of mouth. And if people have had great interactions with you, and each of those interactions have summed up positively, you're going to find that people start doing positive word of mouth. And positive word of mouth is what tells people to go to you for their, their distribution. The reverse applies is that if people have had a whole bunch of negative experiences when dealing with you, what starts happening is negative word of mouth Negative word of mouth erodes your customer base and it erodes your profitability. So why does this matter so much? Well, the reality is, is that it's a hell of a lot more expensive for us to get a new customer than it is for retain, to retain one that we already have. And for some odd reason, we're very good at focusing on getting new customers, but typically we don't focus too much on retaining the ones we have. So, we can't kid ourselves, no customer relationship lasts forever. All of the customers that you have, given enough time, will leave you. So it's essential we hang on to them for as absolute long as possible. I want to start by drawing an analogy. So consider your business to be a home, okay? It's got a front door, it's got a back door, you're doing a house party perhaps, I don't know. But your new customers are coming in through the front door all the time and your old customers are trickling out the back door. So what we try and do, obviously, is we try and get as many people into our sort of proverbial home as possible. We implement a moments of reality exercise. In other words, we say, if we take all of our customer touch points and make sure that they show us a po in a positive light, that's a moments of reality exercise. We implement such a, an exercise, and we'll find that our customers start spending longer in our metaphorical home. Not only are they spending more time there, they're having a great time, and they're spending more money with us. They're having a great time, so they start phoning their pals and going, hey, this is really, really good, I'm getting great service here. And the reality is, is that their pals start queuing up at the front door. So if we make the customer's experience of doing business with us that little bit better or better and consistently better, we tend to find it's easier to bring customers in because they've heard about what a great show we're running. And it's also easier for us to retain customers because there's nothing pushing them away. <clears throat> so in short, a moments of reality exercise is going to see us retaining our customers for longer. It's going to result in increased sales and it's going to result in positive word of mouth. That positive word of mouth is going to make it easier for, easier for us to bring in new customers, okay? So what we need to look at is touch points. Now, if you think of your interaction with your customers, there's a set of logical touch points. For example, a customer phones in to place an order. There's a touch point and the customer has an opportunity to form an opinion. So it's at these touch points that these moments of reality occur when people are judging us. <clears throat> lots and lots and lots of touch points if you look at them carefully. A customer visits your website, uh, a customer visits your Twitter or your LinkedIn or your Instagram or whatever the case may be. 
Customer wants to open an account. I mean, is that process easy? Or is it complicated with lots of supporting documents? Customer phones into your switchboard. Customer calls in for a quotation. Customer phones in to order goods. Let's say, for example, a customer takes delivery of some of your goods. You know, I've heard, you know, I've been involved in some environments where the customer phones in and goes, it's damaged. In fact, there's tire marks on the box, you know. Um, so those types of experiences are the types of things we're looking out for. Customer signs your delivery notes. Perhaps the document's really scruffy and the guy can't work out where to sign. That's not a good positive uh, uh, moment of reality. Customer phones in with a query. Customer has quality problems with your goods. A customer requires technical support. So across all of these touch points, we need to make sure that we're translating into a positive customer experience. When looking for touch points within your organization, the trick is, is to look across the customer life cycle. So the first thing we do is we acquire a fresh customer. And typical to that acquisition phase is you know, people signing out new account applications, perhaps some degree of rep, of rep visits, whatever the case may be. So look for all the touch points that sit in that acquire phase. The serve phase then, I suppose, is from the point in time that we process the first transaction. So that's the bloke phoning into place an order. It's perhaps the, the first receipt of an invoice document, the first receipt of a statement. All of those present a moment of reality. The next phase is the grow phase. And this is where we try and upsell and cross-sell. Uh, and it's... Um, also, I suppose, where we sort of start subjecting our customers to marketing and advertising and radio ads, all of those are all moments of reality and they need to collectively reflect positively. Retaining is the big one. Okay, now, retaining is the little circle that we tend to be less uh, cognizant to. Uh, my, and my hypothesis is that that's perhaps the most important one because it's cost us so much to get that new client the best thing we can do is retain them for as long as possible. From an evaluating performance perspective, I mean, this really comes down to asking long, hard questions. So the first thing is, let's, I'm just taking a few examples. Let's assume that the receipt of an invoice is a moment of reality. I think most of us have that as a moment of reality. Do your customers like your invoice? Is it easily read? Does it look professional? Is it accurate? Uh, does it have the required detail? Um, the accounts department, are they sending it back to your, your bloke to say, chap, they haven't got a VAT number on there, or whatever the case may be. So is it passing muster with the, your customer's accounts department? And was it received in good time? All right, so the questions that you need to ask, I'm afraid, are your questions, but there's a few examples. Another example, perhaps your customers phone in to place orders. And, you know, and there the questions are logical. Are the calls answered within a reasonable period of time? Okay, we all know certain cellular service providers where you could probably make a cup of tea while you wait to speak to someone. Okay, and that isn't a positive moment of reality. We've experienced that. The, the voice quality, is that acceptable? Do you offer email or online ordering? If there is online ordering, is it intuitive and easy to use? Okay, look at the banks. The banks offer online banking. There's no training for that online banking. It's designed to be intuitive. Can your call center give uh, customers an order number at the point in time that they're online placing the order? Uh, do you give customers an order number if they email their orders in? So perhaps via return of email. Do your agents, your call center agents, have the requisite product knowledge? Uh, and are your operating hours convenient to your markets? I mean, if you're running a call center servicing kind of late night owls and the night owls or whatever the case may be, you certainly don't want to close it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So this process of evaluating performance, so the first thing we do is we identify our touch points. Once we've got our touch points, we have a look at each of those touch points and we see where they fall short, okay? We then enter into a touch point redesign phase where we make small tweaks to make sure that they are more likely to result in a positive experience for the customer. We then implement corrective action and we monitor effectiveness. And it's a cycle that just runs and runs and runs and runs. This is not one that stops. 
There is, however, something that stands in its way more often than not. You know, when a, when a business starts out, you'll find that initially there's a single bloke, the entrepreneur, and he doesn't spend a hell of a lot of time arguing with himself. He's hell of a focused on the customer. And perhaps those numbers grow and you get two or three staff members, four staff members. Initially, it's easy to maintain focused on the customer. As we get larger, what happens is, is we start to form departments so that we can start introducing control. And eventually what happens, I think we may have, all of us have seen this once or twice, those departments start entering into like a low sort of key turf warfare with each other and we start pulling in different directions. So what you may have is you may have a salesperson out there and um, he's speaking to customers and telling them about your delivery leads. Unbeknownst to him, the finance guys are telling the supply chain guys to rationalize their delivery schedule to reduce costs and you guys are out of kilter. Your sales folks is pushing an expansionary sales drive. Your debtors folks have been told to tie back the debtors book. So they're not quite as swift at offering credit limit increases. So we're not pulling in the same direction. Our focus isn't external, our focus has become internal, okay? It's silo mentality and it's a destroyer. And it'll certainly, it'll certainly break our moments of reality exercise. So we absolutely need to shift focus to where the customer's in the middle. So now we've identified those touch points, each and every point where we touch our customer. Some of them may be very subtle. All of them count, okay? Because all of them present the opportunity for somebody to form an opinion. And how do you now set about finding out whether those touch points are in fact positive or negative experiences? And it's not difficult, I'm afraid. None of this is really. All you need to do is ask them. You know, I mean, your customers are best equipped to answer these questions. And the easiest way to do that is to send your reps out. Okay, perhaps your senior management go and see your, your really big clients. Your reps go out and, and see the folks. And all you need to do is to make sure that your reps know what moments of reality are. They know what touch points are. They know whether we're looking for a positive outcome to each touch point. You can use surveys. Surveys, in fact, are very similar to another creature called a focus group. So I'll talk about them simultaneously and perhaps even at the same time, is that um, what's nice about surveys is you can get an independent third party to run them. And if you've got an independent third party running a survey, what that means is, is, is that you can keep yourself anonymous, which means that you don't stand the risk of, in fact, introducing a failed moment of reality. All of these touch points are, moments, are opportunities for moments of reality. What's nice about surveys and focus groups is in both cases, you can in fact not just interrogate your own performance, but that of your competitors. So if you find that there is a moment of reality that your customers are experiencing far more positively with you than they are with your competitors, tell your marketing chaps, they'll want to hear about that. They can make ground with that. If you find there's an area where you're underperforming your competitors, then obviously you need to do some redesign work there. Mystery shopping is a kind of an easy one. What you need to do is as the CEO, you phone in, phone into the call center. How many rings? When the chap answered, was he polite? Was the process comfortable? Phone into your switchboard. How long did it take? Did the switchboard operator speak clearly? Was she polite? Uh, so as a CEO, you can introduce that and it costs nothing. Um, customer forums are an interesting one because uh, you can't establish your customer forum too soon, to be quite frank. Rather wait until you kind of found your feet um, because if you are still in that negative moment of reality space and you host the customer forum, your customers will take the opportunity to vent and it's going to take you nowhere. So find your feet. Once you think you're in fact starting to win, then establish a customer forum. But remember that a customer forum is a moment of reality. So if people start giving you a message and they see that you're not listening to that message or acting on it, you're in trouble. Sanity checking. So now we've got our touch points. We've got all the bits and pieces that we're going to do in our redesign of those touch points. You need to sanity check them. These are questions that I think strike me as logical. All our environments are different. So you're going to want to tweak for your environment 
But the questions really are, have I simplified this as much as possible? Have I cut out as much red tape? God, I wish the government were listening. Um, will it leave a positive impression? Am I minimizing inconvenience? And importantly, one of the things that we forget is our very function is to maximize customer value. That's all we do. Is it customer-centric, all right? So is it firmly focused on the customer, or are we still engaged in that low-key turf warfare? Uh, is it what the customer expects? Is it intuitive, all right, like that online banking system? And is the design better than that of my competitors? So if you get a whole house of yeses, go, do it. If you get one or more noes, you may have a little bit more homework to do. What is the objective of moments of reality? Now, the objective fundamentally is we want to make it easy for people to do business with us, okay? If it's easy for folks to do business with us, that's exactly what they'll do. If we put up a whole bunch of hoops that our customers are expected to jump through, they'll jump through those hoops and they'll jump straight into your competitor's court, okay? So make it easy for your customers to do business with you. You don't want any disincentives. You can't implement a moments of reality exercise and then just assume that the game is finished, okay? It's because it, it's something that carries on in an endless cycle. Your competitive environment is shifting. The needs of your customers are shifting. We've got new generations of new people that think in new ways. God knows what the millennials will do to us. All right, so we've got all of these new variables in place, and you're going to have to continue to shift with them. Touch points need to be tweaked. It's a cycle. The one thing is, is that if you're expecting an immediate turnaround, okay, oh, we did it last week, Thursday, the reality is it's going to take a hell of a long time. If there are negative opinions that your customer base have built up surrounding their impression of you, if you've built that up over a long period of time to turn the tide and make it positive, it will equally take a long time. Because this isn't a quick fix, it's a long-term vision. Rules of engagement are a very interesting one, and specifically in the supply chain space. So we have all these touch points, and uh, we, we design how we're going to interact with those touch points. Let's assume one of those touch points is uh, taking a customer order. Now, the rules of engagement from a customer standpoint is they need to phone a particular number between hours X and Y, uh, you know, and, and that perhaps they need to present their purchase order number or whatever the rules are. So it's important that you, in fact, tell your customers what the rules of engagement are. And we typically don't place a hell of a lot of emphasis on giving our customers the cheat sheets on how to do business with us easily. So what you'll find is that customers that know your rules of engagement find it easy to do business with you, and as a consequence, do exactly that. They do lots of business with you. But in the distribution space, there's another variable that I've noticed is that about 50% of your queries are typically as a consequence of customer errors. And if you look at that 50%, at least half of that is typically as the consequence of the customer, in fact, not knowing the rules of engagement. So they make mistakes as a consequence. They phone in and place an order after the cutoff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you communicate your rules of engagement, you have fewer queries, and fewer queries are really neat because you've got reduced cost. We all know it costs a lot of money to process queries, and it's intangible. And you also have happier customers, which is what we're all after. So um, when you onboard new customers, in much the same way as when you onboard new staff, you try and make sure that you show them the rules of engagement. If customers don't like your rules of engagement, now I'm not a very funny guy, but this one I thought was quite good. Fix them, the rules, not the customer. Okay, so if your customers don't like your rules of engagement, that's the whole objective of the exercise, is we then change the way in which we function. Okay, processes and touch points need to be continually revised, and rules of engagement too. If we have a look at an iceberg, it's a, it's a kind of a common analogy, but it's a small portion of it above the waterline, and the vast bulk of it sits beneath the waterline. If we have a look at an iceberg, we'll see that portion that we're seeing, consider that to be the touch point, and the portion that we're not seeing, in other words, is not visible to the customer, that's the balance of the process. 
So customers don't see our entire process. They only see the portions that we expose to them. And our objective, of course, is to make sure those exposed portions of our process result in positive customer experiences. From a, a, a placing business processing, from placing business processes into context, business processes are again are something that certainly from a supply chain perspective, we often have them in place for the QA folks. It's tough to live them, but they're really, really important. And the reality is, is that if you're really great at business process uh, and you really, really live them, you'll tend to prosper relative to your competitors, particularly if you have better business processes. Business processes actually constitute an intangible asset because they embody all the learnings. I mean, if your business is 50 years old, they embody 50 years worth of learnings. So they really, really have a real asset value. And continuous improvement is obviously what we need to engage in to make sure that we're continually refining those business processes. As we refine business processes, of course, the touch points are changing. And as the touch points change, we need to revise our rules of engagement. So I'm sure that we all focus on business process, drag moments of reality into the conversation, drag the touch points into the conversation, and start thinking clearly about what are the rules of engagement and how are we communicating them to the customer. So what I'm proposing is that you take your standard operating procedures and you put a new section in which identifies any touch points and provides guidance to your people in terms of how to manage those touch points to make sure that they have positive outcomes. Okay, so the question often gets asked is how many touch points should I have? And the answer is the fewer the better. Okay, so if you think of small business, I'm from a small business, and um, if you think of my relationship with the government, for example, I spend half of my life jumping through hoops and the other half filling out forms. The reality is, is that the relationship between the state and the small business sector has that many touch points that are superfluous that it in fact it impedes the economy. So the reality is the fewer the touch points, the better. Your customers don't exist solely to do business with you. They've got a myriad of things to look after like the government and all that sort of stuff. So the reality is, is if there's a touch point that isn't adding value, then knock it on the head, it's gone, okay? Your touch points need to be designed to ensure that where they exist, they actually add customer value or provide customer context, context that your customer needs. If a touch point doesn't add value, boot it. And if you're struggling to get the balance right, let's return to the basics. Ask your customer, hey, when we do this, does it add value? No, I can never understand why you do that. Super, thanks for the feedback, it's gone. Okay. Another one which I find interesting is you know, you're filling out all these damn forms. And I often think to myself, I wonder whether anyone actually uses that. Don't ever collect any information that you have no intention of using, okay? Because it just doesn't add any value and it's taking up someone's time. So far, we've spoken to the external customer, and that's the right place to start because we need to be focused on them. But you can do a moments of reality exercise on anyone, okay? You could do a moments of reality exercise on your suppliers, and in fact, that's probably a very good idea to do. Interestingly enough, though, is you could do an internal moments of reality exercise. So if you think of, for example, the folks in HR and the folks in, who else are we going to pick on today? Uh, IT. Let's pick on the IT guys. Those folks are landlocked, okay? So they don't have external customers. But, you know, it's entirely conceivable that uh, your staff find it difficult to deal with them in which case there's a moment of reality problem. And if you fix those internal moments of reality problems, you start breaking down those resistance layers between silos. You add in some efficiency again, and also what you do is you sensitize your community because they start developing clarity that the role that they play, although, they're not, although they're, they may be landlocked, that they're still playing a supporting role in the provision of service to an end customer. Critical success factors is fundamentally treat it like a project, okay? It's a simple process. You get your touch points. 
You flesh out your redesigns for each touch point and then set up a project. Get a competent project or program manager. Get yourself a committed sponsor. Make sure you communicate broadly to your people so that you take them with you. And, uh, you know, get it going. I'm actually doing quite well here. I've got four minutes left and I'm on my last slide. Um, I tend to speak too much, so I seem to be winning today. In closing, great customer service is an intangible concept, okay? Uh, and because it's an intangible concept, that's fundamentally why we typically don't go that road, okay? We typically don't pick that up as a real focus. But because we've looked at it through a moments of reality lens, uh, it allows us to make it tangible, okay? Because moments of reality results in a tactical level plan that you can project manage, okay? So it becomes tangible, which means that you can, in fact, entrench a competitive advantage of customer service. Great customer service is the most defensible competitive advantage, okay? Trust me, there's no more difficult thing to achieve and there's no easier thing to, to defend, okay? And it places the customer exactly where they need to be, center stage. Folks, uh, this talk is the consequence of a white paper. So if you would like to pick up the white paper, as well as a podcast, as well as these slides, you can go to www.therefore.coze forward slash sapex. I'll add more bits and pieces there over the next couple of weeks. You guys got any questions? Thanks very much. Thanks.